you want to hang around so when you do push and redline, you can actually close them out. In tennis, if you have a bad mental patch, you can lose you can lose games so fast. Two, three, four games. What's going on guys? It's Coach Steven with 15 points of tennis. And we're out here on the track today and look, guarantee you this is not a video about fitness. Because today we're gonna to talk about not only what it takes to be a great competitor, okay, but what it takes to be a smart competitor, more importantly. I can't believe it. From the forehand, and you still, how does he do this? Eight, seven, nine, nine. Fitting, isn't it? Eight, eight, eight. will not let this end. Okay, now the assumption we want to start with is that like tennis is not a sport like baseball where you can hit a home run, knock it out of the park, and win on one, one shot. Or boxing where one knockout punch, you can knock your opponent out. No. Tennis, in tennis you have to win over and over and over and over again. Okay? And perform for a long period of time, much like a sport like cross country. See, it's not a sprint, right? Like, so you hit the most amazing shot in the world, and it's still only worth one point. And you might say, look, Coach Steven, I'm a power player. I'm a servant volleyer. Like, I play really aggressive. Yeah, but I'd say it's still, you're still out here grinding for, for whether it's an hour, 90 minutes, two hours. Okay? So, like I said, we're out here on the track. And let's say I gave you a little challenge. Let's say I said, I want you to run three miles around the track. Keep it simple, okay? Three miles, which is 12 laps. But if I said, you, you, let's say I, I said you had to sprint, I forced you to sprint that first lap at 100% as if a bear is chasing you like your life dependent on it, okay? If you had to sprint that first lap, how would that affect your overall performance to run those three miles? Now, a quick story for you. I was, I was actually at a tournament in Fresno, okay, in Copper River Country Club, and I was number one seed. First, I was playing my first round opponent and I think the first round, he's trying to leave a good impression on me, right? So he comes out, comes out of the gate, he's bouncing around, he's super jacked up, super intense, right? He li literally looks like Rafa Nadal uh, uh, on a sugar high. I mean, this guy's, this guy's going, right? And so he comes out, man, he, he destroys me, first point, second point, third point. I remember he, he wins that first game, he finishes me off, he, he rips a short forehand, he stands right over the net, he looks at me, he says, come on, right at me. And in my, my mind, I'm thinking, like, holy, holy cow, right? First of all, not a good start for me. But luckily for me, tennis, you know, we're not playing to one game. We're playing to 12 games. Okay, so we switched sides. I turned it into a long, grinding match. Okay, I drew the match out. And my, my opponent's energy level, while he started at a 10 out of 10, it came down to, like, a 2 out of 10, 3 out of 10. Well, my energy level, like I maintained a 7 out of 10, 8 out of 10. And the rest of the match, I didn't, I didn't blow him out like he blew me out the first game. In fact, a lot of the games after were, were quite tough games individually. But I won every game, so every single game after. I won 6-1, 6-0. Okay, now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't come out of the gates and play hard. I'm not saying you shouldn't come out and leave it all out there on the court. Okay, I'm not saying that. Okay, you absolutely should. What I'm saying is, at a higher level, what you want to be able to master is something called energy management. Okay? Uh, watch that cat. But just like running, if I told you you had to run 12 laps around this track at 100%, you couldn't do it without getting tired midway through. Similarly, you couldn't play an entire match at 100% and maintain that energy level. It's just not possible. And trying to go at 100% and, and push it all the way, that's a term we call redlining. And it's a, it's a racing term, obviously. And it, on a technical level, it means you're pushing a car past and exceeding a car's maximum RPMs. So you're going, right? It's not sustainable performance. All right, so now before we continue with this video, I want to clarify energy level, okay? When I talk about energy and just in general, 
we're talking about both mental energy and physical energy. Now, and I'll give you examples of both. So physical energy, obviously, if I'm moving my body and, and running for balls, okay, that's physical energy. But there's a difference, okay, between me sprint, just normally sprinting to get a ball and redlining, okay? An example of redlining, if you put a gun to my head and said, get that ball over the net, your life depends on it. Typically, I would just sprint to that ball to try to save it and get it. But it, redlining, that's like if I were to sprint at 110% and dive to get that ball, right? That would be an example of redlining. With mental energy, obviously, you're, you're hitting the ball. You're not always winded and using a ton of physical energy, per se. You're not, like, out of breath and running around. But when I talk about mental energy, I'm talking about your focus level, okay? Especially when you're attacking, you have to stay very focused because you're putting away a short ball. You're hitting up the line. It takes a lot of precision, okay? It takes a lot of, it puts a lot of, it takes a lot of focus, okay, when, when you're playing offense, okay? That's why I'm referring to mental energy. Now, an example of redlining when it comes to mental energy is, okay, slice serve out wide, to win the game, I'm focused. But if you put a gun to my head and said, do it or die, now you really have my attention. Now I'm really going to lock in and focus. And it doesn't guarantee that I'm going to hit that slice serve in or hit an ace. But yeah, but it's going to raise my, it's going to raise my level, my energy level for sure. Okay. Now, not part of this video per se, but uh, just that little example I used. Um, when you play defense and you're moving, it, defense actually takes a lot more physical energy. Defense doesn't take as much mental energy because you don't have to be that precise on defense. You just have to move your butt. Well, as mental energy doesn't take a whole lot of physical energy per se, but when you, if you're not focused on offense, it could be an absolute disaster. Okay. Now, the reason why we talk about all this stuff, look, you know, your, your energy tank. Your energy, your energy tank is not finite. You only have so much energy, which means instead of redlining the whole time, just like cross country for where you're running a race, you have to pace yourself. You have to pace yourself and find something stable, sustainable, again, in terms of physical expenditure, until a mental focus, right? You can play well for the entire match. Now, I would say... And we're going to talk, get into some interesting scenarios for you guys. And it gets really interesting, right? How to strategize going about doing this. But generally speaking for the average player, I'd say about maybe 80% to 90%, point in, point out, you probably want to be playing about 80 to 90% of your maximum energy level. So you're playing really hard. You're just not diving for balls like it's match point of Wimbledon. Okay? So, so far in this video, okay, pacing. Pacing is a good thing, but... Redlining, I know it's, I kind of framed it in a bad way so far, but there are actually times when redlining is not only essential, but you must redline. You absolutely should redline, okay? But when you do redline, it, it should be very strategic. And I want to pose this question to you guys. How often do you see Roger Federer or Rafael Nadal and they're four all in a set, they're five all in a set, Six, so the set's really close. But how often do they win those sets, either 6-4, 7-5, 7-6? How often, how common is that? It happens all the time. It ha happens almost every time, to be, to be fair. And why is that? Because those guys are pacing themselves in the beginning of the set. And, what, and them pacing themselves early in the set allows them to raise their level when the set gets really close, okay, to close out the set. And again, they tighten their focus. They come up with big shots. And the funny thing is, let's say you're the opponent and you think, okay, hey, I'm, I'm four all with Rafa. I'm five all with Federer. I'm doing pretty good, right? We, we split 50% of the games. Shouldn't it just be a coin toss? Absolutely not. You're still so far from, from closing those guys out. Again, because they kick it up a notch. They kick it up two notches, three notches, right? Now it's, and it's not just at the end of the set. Obviously, like, the, they pace themselves for the match. Because in 2017 Australian Open, what we saw is after Federer and Rafa, they split sets two all apiece. Again, they pushed themselves to the maximum. We've seen tennis, insane tennis, that you, we've never even seen before. Again, those guys are pushing themselves to the very brink, 
of their level. And, and even as great as they are, okay, you have to understand, even as great as they are, those guys can't play like that all the time. They can't because, you know, scientifically, apparently, you know, you get a hit of adrenaline, even a, it only lasts about 10 to 20 minutes, okay? And that's why we talk about energy management. Now, not just Roger and Federer, I want to also discuss how, how a few other players manage their energy in interesting ways, okay? Let's talk Pete, Pete Sampras. And you can throw Ivo Karlovich into that, uh, into that category as well, all right? So P Pete Sampras, obviously, you know, one of the great servers of all time, it's much more priority for him to hold serve and just to try to take that one break. So Pete Sampras, let's just throw out numbers here. Let's say Pete is like 95% focused on his service games, but his return games, clearly he's not trying as hard as he's kind of moping around and this. So maybe he's going about 80% on his return games. But, but if an opportunity presents itself, let's say Pete's opponent maybe goes through a little bit of a mental lapse. It's on, 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 on the return game, let's say Sampras goes up love 30. Now you see Sampras's focus really tightened. Now he's going at 100%. Now he's hustling for, hard for every ball. He's super focused on attack because if he takes that one game, he wins the set, right? A little bit like Ivo Karlovic as well. But on the flip side, a guy like Nadal, you know, he's not, his strategy isn't to try to just hold serve and steal a game to win the set, uh, steal a break to win the set. Nadal is trying to beat his opponent down and put body blows on his opponent, okay, for two hours, two and a half hours, three hours. So instead of going from like 80% to 100%, Nadal's, if I were to guess, throw out some numbers here, Nadal's probably playing around 90%, point in and point out, which is still pretty hard, okay, he's going pretty hard. But yet, either in a tie break or at the end of the set, when he really needs to, he's, he he pushes him, his emotions to that next level. You see him really start to fist pump, right? And he still has an extra gear or two gears. He kicks his game up. Now, we talked a lot. We talked, we talked quite a bit. But I want to pose maybe an important question is, based on all this, how should you go about managing your energy level? Okay, and I want to give my two cents here. Look, there's a lot of gray area, guys. This is not a science. This is definitely an art, and it's a kind of a guesstimate. But there are a lot of variables. We want to go through them, right? And the first variable is actually you. You as a variable. And how are you feeling that day? Because every day you're feeling different. Are you feeling energetic? Are you feeling a little tired? And again, this depends. This really determines how much gas you have in the tank. It's going to determine how you pace yourself. The second factor for you is what is your play style? Are you a grinding methodical player or are you more spontaneous and, and explosive? Right? That makes a big difference because you know obviously we, we talk about a sport like cross country and pacing yourself, but pacing yourself over two miles is very different from pacing yourself over four miles. Very different. Alright, so if you're looking to hit 20 balls every rally versus you're looking to put strings of points together, again, shorter points, so you're going to use your energy a little faster. Now, we want to think about your opponent as well, okay? And ultimately, guys, look, we talk about cross country, you want to run the best, absolute base, best race that you can run, meaning at the end of the race, you want to put your optimal performance out there, right? Like when you look at that final time, you want to put your best time out there when you run a race. So let's say we're at the starting line. The gun goes off, and your opponent sprints out. Just like that example, he's at Copper River Country Club. Yeah, I, I'm not going to go chase my. I'm not going to stupidly chase my opponent just because he's sprinting right off the start, right? So I'm not going to just chase him out of the gates. Of course not. But again, based on your opponent, if my opponent is making a steady surge forward, let's say my opponent is going one zero on me, two zero, three zero, four zero. Well, okay, you actually don't want to get too far behind because if your opponent gets off to a 4-0 lead, in order for you to catch up to your opponent, it's going to be it's going to be so tough to catch up and you'll probably and you'll probably have to red line to catch up and you, it's going to be hard to catch up and close your opponent out 
it's just too far of a distance. Like if I was running a cross country race, typically I want to stay close enough to the pack. I want to stay close enough to, com to my competitors. So when I do make my push, not only can I catch my competitors, I can pass my competitors. And at the end of the day, guys, you have to catch and pass your competitors in order to win. So that's why if your opponent is making a surge, like in tennis, they call it, you know, weathering the storm. You want to try to play well enough to stay close. You want to hang around. So when you do push and redline, you can actually close them out. Now, I do want to say that's more, slightly more of an advanced topic, okay? Exactly when to make the push. I would say more for the beginner intermediate level, which, you know, is actually most of us, what's even more important than making a huge push and a spurt is to actually not have any bad mental lapses. Because just know that a bad mental lapse, so look guys, in tennis, if you have a bad mental patch, you can lose, you can lose games so fast, two, three, four games, okay? Just a, a few minutes of, of, of bad tennis can cancel out a ton of good tennis, right? So let's say you work 20 minutes and you got yourself up 4-2, just losing focus for five, six, seven minutes, now, you're, now it's 4-all, four 4-5, four you're even down. Okay, so it's more important, like if you're running a long cross-country race, it's probably more important that you're consistent throughout the race than if you just have one little quick spurt, okay? So I wanna always put that in perspective. Now, in terms of starting races, matches, Finish, finishing matches. Okay, I want to kind of give you my personal preference here. I personally like to ease my way into a match. Like, I know Roger Federer, and now Roger Federer is pretty much the only one who can do this. Roger comes out right out, out of the gates, just firing, 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 and he can blow you off the court. Maybe it's just a huge gap in skill level sometimes, and he's that good he can do it, but most players can't do that. Most players, and including myself, I like to ease my way into matches. One, because I'm taking those first games to just find my rhythm, feel out the game, right, get into a flow, okay? But second of all, in those first few games, I'm, I'm doing a self-assessment because I don't know how I'm feeling that day yet. I don't know if I'm feeling tired or energetic, so I'm doing a self-assessment how I should pace myself moving forward. And I'm assessing my opponent, whether my opponent's gonna make a push early or if my opponent's coming out a little sluggish and I can get the jump on my opponent, all right? Now, <clears throat> if my opponent obviously start, starts blowing me out, okay, early in the, early in the match, again, I, I know to hit the gas, okay? So I'm not gonna be stupid about it, right? I'm gonna hit the gas if my opponent just comes out firing. I'm gonna try to stay close to them, right? And, and then see how it goes. Now, <clears throat> We, we talk a lot about, about the race, right? Running your best race. And that's an important concept to understand, but you're doing great. You made it this far in the video. But I want to create, and this is important to know if you're thinking about how to pace yourself in energy management. Structurally, playing a match is different from running just one long cross country race. Because a cross country race is start to finish. A match isn't start to finish. In a match, you're actually playing sets. And these sets are actually mini races, they're smaller races inside of a big race. You're not just running one big race, you're running a bunch of small races. And that changes fundamentally how you go about managing your energy. And so let's think about this for a sec. All right, let me give you a scenario. So let's say, let's say I'm playing set, I'm down 4-0 to a big server. I'm down 4-0. The chances of me coming back against a big server, nil. Very small. Okay? Even if I were to use red line and use all my energy, 100% energy, it'd be futile, it'd be wasted energy because I'd still probably get closed out by a big server. So instead of wasting my energy in that first set, what I should do, or what I'll probably do is take those two games, do a little experimentation. Okay, maybe change my return stance, see, see what works. But I'm gonna, instead of wasting my energy on that first set, I'm gonna go into the second set, really locked and loaded, really focused and mentally prepared, and try to get a good, a good jump, put my, a good foot, foot step forward, 
in that next set. And what's even worse is like junior tournaments a lot of the time, they, they, these guys play uh, 10 point tiebreakers for a third set. They don't even play a full third set, right? Which creates more variability. But let's say, let's say you know you lost the first set, whether it's a close first set, let's say you lost the first set, right? And then you're, then you're up 4-0 in the second set. And again, instead of trying to use all your energy in the second set, no, instead of trying to close your opponent out 6-0 and hit miraculous shots and use all your energy, I would say the logical thing to do is, you know, pace your way into the finish line for that second set, right? Try to close that set out more routinely and then really be sharp going into the tie break. But you can see a lot of players, they get up 4-0 in the second set. Let's say they lost the first set. A lot of players will get up 4-0 in the second set and, you know, kind of for their own ego, right? Just to, make, to look good and have the score look, for the aesthetic of the score to look 6-0, they want to crush their opponent. They want to close their opponent out. So they use all their mental energy to win that second set, but they don't have enough gas to finish their opponent off, okay? That's called mismanaging your energy. And even a worse opponent, if they put a streak together in that third set 10-point tiebreaker, they can take that tiebreaker, okay? And that's why this stuff is really important. Now, guys, don't overthink it. Don't overthink it too much because, look, obviously, if you're five all, six all in a tie break, if it's close, if you're down a set in a break, if you're, if you're down a set in a break, you better hit the gas. And you better hit the gas really hard, okay? Because there's, otherwise you'll be shaking hands with your opponent, right? <laughs> they won't, so, so I wanna wrap with one last concept, and this is actually an important concept we're gonna talk about here. Because we talk so much about pacing, but what I even see more, more of a problem, because I always wanna put this into perspective, right? What I see as a, even a bigger problem than just poor pacing is I see under pacing. And this just goes for a lot of more beginner intermediate level players in general, okay? And I'll, you know, quick story, as one night I was playing a set with a student and you know, this girl, you know, highly competitive player, she's just younger, so very good player. So we were playing a set and you know, she wasn't moving with much intensity. She wasn't very focused on her attack and her balls are spraying. She just wasn't using much energy at all. So 20 minutes later, bang, set over. You know, I sit down next to her on a bench and you know, as coaches, right? You know, I ask her, basically I ask her, on a scale of one to 10, one being you're super fresh, right. like you've never played tennis, you haven't played tennis today yet. And 10 being you, your legs are so tired, you, you can't walk the next day. Where are you on that scale? And she responds to me, she's like, two? And in my mind, I think like, are you serious? No, I didn't say that. What I said to her was, the reason why you have all this energy is so you can leave it out there on the court. Right now we're sitting on the bench and all your energy, all your wonderful energy is right on the bench next to you. The reason why you train so hard, the reason why you, is to, so you can have this huge gas tank that you can empty out, empty out there and, and use it. Use it and put it into the ball. Put it into running balls down. Put it into putting pressure on your opponent. But instead, you know, what, if you're not an 8 out of 10 tired, if you're not a 9 out of 10 tired or a 10 out of 10 tired, you've definitely done something wrong. Okay, and that's the issue. Like you can probably push yourself a lot harder than you think. That's, a, that's actually the more common issue that I see with most players. So I know you think about this advanced topic, don't think, oh, okay, just because you know, Coach Steven said to pace himself, I can play it at 60%. No, you know, Nadal's out there playing at 90%. You're, you're probably not playing at 90%, or you know, most of you guys. Most players, when you go at a tournament and just look out across all the players, most people are at like 70% which they should probably be playing a little bit harder, you know, on average, okay? Now, so, again, this is, a, this is a guessing game. You don't know exactly how much energy you have, so it's, you're always guesstimating, but I, I say err on the side of generosity compared to be conservative, because the last thing you want is all your energy to be sitting next to you on the bench and regret not leaving everything out there on the court, all right? So, I know it's a long video today, Thanks so much, that wraps it for today. I know normally I, I like to put out more, like a technical based video and then a more mental based video and alternate it. Obviously when it's just wet and rainy, this is pretty much all we got. So 
Thanks so much. Thanks for your support of the channel. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like, subscribe button. It helps out the channel. Again, thank you for supporting the channel so far. This is Coach Steven. We'll see you on the next episode.